Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 48 of True Crime All the Time. I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me, as always, is my partner in True Crime, Mike Gibson. Gibby, what's going on? Hey, man, what's happening? Hey, man. Hey, man. What's happening? I used to like that show, What's Happening. What's happening with Raj? And Rerun. Rerun. Yeah. Dwayne. Dwayne, yeah. What was the girl's name? I don't remember. I don't either. But we'll give we'll we'll put that out because somebody will write in. That's right. Got to give it. Got to give something for people to uh, to tell us. It's uh, Roz or it is Roz, isn't it? I think it might be. Yeah. A lot of people are like, "Don't you just put it in your phone and look it up, guys?" <laughs> I know. <laughs> we, but we don't do that. I don't do that. It's part of the fun. All right, Gibbs, you ready to get into our topic today? I'm ready. And in this episode, we're talking about Austin Sig. And the murder of Jessica Ridgway. And we got to start out talking about Jessica. Jessica Ridgway was a 10-year-old girl. She had a gap in her front teeth. She liked to pretend that she was a cheerleader. She liked to pretend that she was a waitress when she was playing. And this is a little girl that loved to laugh, loved to giggle. She adored the color purple. And... Like a lot of little girls, she wanted to be older. And I experienced this with my own kids. They want to be older. They want to do what the older kids are doing. I remember my kids saying, I can't wait till I'm 16 so I can drive. Or I can't wait till I'm this old so I can do this. And I would always tell them, don't wish your life away. Now that comes with getting older. You realize oh yeah, that you don't want to do that. But as a little kid... You just want to get old so you can do the things you want to do on your own. And we say the same things to our parents and our parents said the same thing back to us. And it's just that cycle. Yeah, it really is. Jessica was a 10 year old girl. She had her whole life ahead of her and her mother would come out and say that, you know, she had talked to Jessica like most mothers do about being very cautious around strangers. Her mom even warned her to scream for help. If somebody ever tried to grab her, she was aware of the whole stranger danger thing that we've talked about before. And there was an interesting story about Jessica that I want to talk about. And it centers around a school assignment that she had been working on in which she was supposed to write out different types of sentences. And she had completed this assignment in her little child handwriting And it was a mixture of some large letters, some really small letters. You know how little kids write. And the first sentence she wrote was, do not play at the park alone. And then next to that, she wrote imperative sentence, pretty much just means a command sentence. And the second one she wrote is watch out for strangers. And then she put, you know, this is an exclamatory sentence, self-explanatory, a sentence to express strong emotion. So pretty good for a a 10-year-old girl. Yeah, impressive. Very impressive, and I know what you're thinking. Exactly. That you didn't know what those types of sentences were. I just say what I got to say. I don't know if I could have told you what they were. I could have maybe back in the day, but I wanted to point that out because, unfortunately, it's foreshadowing because we know that Jessica Ridgway is going to be murdered. You know, this was a little girl who loved to dance loved to sing. She would make up silly words and and laugh at them. It was said that she had these luminous blue eyes that sparkled behind the purple glasses that she always wore. She was so full of joy. She was loved by not only her friends, her peers, but also teachers. I mean, teachers would come out and say that this was the type of student that you wanted to have in your class. This was the type of of kid that you would be proud to say was your own. You know, that's the type of praise that would come out from teachers. And Jessica loved animals. She had a dog, some fish, even a couple of frogs. Her favorite TV shows were Victorious, Shake It Up, and Wizards of Waverly Place. And this one kind of hits me a little hard, Gibbs, because, you know, I have two girls. I've seen all these shows. Yeah, same here. I've seen probably every episode of these shows with my own daughters. It was said that Jessica really enjoyed watching her cousin play baseball and 
she liked to take care of these hairless cats that one of her neighbors owned. She participated in peewee cheer and told everybody that when she grew up and she got into high school, her big dream was to be a cheerleader. But Jessica Ridgway would go missing on October 5th, 2012. And we have to talk about the events of that day. Jessica's alarm went off at 7.45 a.m. that morning, and it would come out later that she had been given this alarm clock because she wanted to set her own alarm. She wanted to be in charge of getting up on her own because she wanted to be self-sufficient. Like we mentioned, she wanted to grow up. Pretty amazing little girl. Yeah, she really is. And that, you know, that's what I'm trying to get across. That October 5th morning was pretty normal. Jessica had a routine. She would watch TV. She ate a granola bar. And then she went upstairs to get dressed. And before leaving for school, she peeled an orange with her mother that she was going to take with her. Now, her mom, Sarah Ridgway, at the time, she was a 31-year-old single mom. And she worked third shift, 10 to 7. So she had just returned home from her overnight shift. She worked as tech support for a software company in Boulder. And this allowed her to see Jessica off in the morning. And then she would wake up by 4. So she would be there when Jessica got home from school. Jessica called a friend of hers that lived down the block to see if he was going to be walking to school so that they could walk together. She ended up talking to her friend's dad who said that his son would wait for Jessica. Now, this would come out later, obviously, from the dad. This was around 8.25 a.m. But when Jessica didn't get to her friend's house by 8.40, the father and son just figured that you know she'd either walked alone or her mom had taken her and the dad took his son and drove him to school. Her mom would come out and say later that, you know, it was snowing out. I watched Jessica walk out the door. I shut the door. And this is the last time I ever saw her. When Jessica didn't make it to Witt Elementary, school officials tried to contact her mother. This was not normal for Jessica not to be in school. She loved school. And her mom hadn't called in that day to say that she wasn't going to be there. So they called her mother around 10 a.m., but they couldn't get a hold of her. Because remember, Sarah worked third shift. She had to go to sleep in order to get up by the time that Jessica got home. So all school officials could do was leave a voicemail. And Sarah Ridgway would come out later and say that that day she did not have her cell phone with her in the bedroom. And it was because she had applied to a college and this college was constantly calling her. And she was super tired that day and she really needed to get some sleep. So she put the cell phone in another room and she would get the message on her cell phone that afternoon. She was thinking, you know, Gibbs, there's got to be some sort of mistake here. Well, I bet. And that had to be, oh, panic. Right. I mean, I don't know how else you would describe it. The school calls and says, hey, your daughter never made it to school. One, you're freaking out. Where is my kid? And and two, I think she was probably thinking guilt because she didn't have her phone with her. And could she have got that message earlier and been out there looking? If not, then that would come later for sure. You know, it would. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that she's thinking probably is that, you know, it's got to be a mistake because she saw Jessica leave for school. She knows she didn't stay home. So her first instinct is to leave the house, go out looking for Jessica. She drove past the park near their house. No sign of Jessica there. She tried the friend's house that Jessica was supposed to walk to school with. There was no answer there at all. And then she went to the school and she found out that no one had seen her daughter all day. And Sarah Ridgway would say it was at that point she knew something very wrong had happened. She talked about getting that pit in your stomach. She's my rock. She, she's, I mean, she's all of our rock. A mother. The bright voice of my little girl. 
She needs to come home. And a father. I try to stay positive about it, but, uh... Yeah, it's hard. Two parents distraught over the disappearance of their little girl. Jessica Ridgway was last seen leaving her mother Sarah's home on Friday. I watch her walk out the door and I shut the door. And that's the last time I saw her. And I want to come walking through back through that door. You get the pit in your stomach that that is not ever, ever anything I want ever any parent to go through. So in that newscast, you can really, you know, you can hear the emotion. She talks about the pit in her stomach. She talks about that, you know, this is something that she wouldn't want any parent to have to go through. But, you know, in my opinion, Gibbs, this is something no parent should ever have to go through. Yeah. I mean, we've all had a little taste of it. I mean, really little taste. Really when, small. When we, when we thought we've lost our child at the, at the grocery store or or wherever we were, right? And we turn around, and you, they're not there. And you, oh my gosh, it just makes you, you panic. And that's that's something that's small. You know, this is bigger level. I can't even imagine. No, I would agree. I can't imagine it on that that large scale. I can't imagine the feeling. And it's at this point that Sarah calls the Westminster police to report her daughter missing. The police followed their standard procedures. One police officer went to the home that Jessica shared with her family. One went to the elementary school. The police were trying to put together a solid timeline of what happened that day to see if anyone knew where Jessica was, had been, or what had happened to this girl. The police would start looking into Jessica's father, who you actually heard on that clip. He did not live with the family In fact, he at the time was living in Missouri. Jessica's parents hadn't been together for quite some time. They were currently dealing with a legal issue because the father had fallen behind on his child support payments. And it was the day that his daughter disappeared that the court held a hearing about the child support issue and the police needed to know if Jessica's father had been in court that day or if he could have possibly been involved in the disappearance of his daughter. But it didn't take police long to find out that her father had been in Missouri and had actually attended the court hearing. So that was one lead that police could let go. They knew her father couldn't have been in Colorado that day. The police had search dogs out canvassing the park near her home, the school, houses in the neighborhood, They were checking out cars along the route that she would have walked to school. They had these dogs everywhere trying to pick up a scent of Jessica. At the same time, police and other first responders were walking across the parks, through fields, on foot, trying to find any evidence of, trying to find any trail of Jessica Ridgeway. And it was by 9.15 that night that police made the decision that they had enough information to assume Jessica had been taken by a stranger and an Amber Alert was issued. They brought in lights to light up Chelsea Park and this was the area where they were focusing a lot of their searching on for Jessica. They had firefighters using thermal imaging equipment in the darkness to try to find her as well. Police even tried to get a helicopter from Denver that had night vision. But apparently it was so cold that night that the helicopter couldn't fly because they were afraid that the blades would get icy. But by the next day on Saturday, Gibbs, it was said that maybe as many as a thousand people showed up to help in the search for Jessica Ridgeway. That's a lot of people. That's a good showing. That's a big outpouring of support. Yeah, I love that. Because this was not all friends and family This was a lot of strangers, people that didn't even know Jessica, but wanted to pitch in. They wanted to find this little girl. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if you just have little kids in general, you're going to be out there. Even if you don't have kids, you know, you got nieces, nephews. Well, by and large, people have huge hearts and we've said it, but when kids are involved, people will pull out all stops, right? People will give up their time. 
They'll do whatever it takes. And that's a great thing about to say about our society. The problem is, even with all the help, even with all the volunteers and the technology, they could not figure out what happened to Jessica Ridgway. She had vanished. Obviously, her family is beyond worried. They just wanted Jessica to come home. But what would come out about what actually happened that day would be the stuff of nightmares. Because Jessica was walking to school that day. She was going to meet her friend. And this was not a very long walk. I mean, it it was something that would have taken her four or five minutes to make. And as Jessica was walking, she's picking up handfuls of snow, making snowballs. She's being a little girl. She's doing what (laughs) she's supposed to be doing. And she's dressed in this big, puffy black jacket to stay warm. But unbeknownst to Jessica, there was a Jeep Cherokee parked down the street with someone inside who was watching Jessica and would ultimately end her life. And it's going to be a young man, Gibbs, that's hiding in this Jeep, crouched down where no one can see him. His name was Austin Sig. He was a 17-year-old student at the time at Arapahoe Community College where he was studying mortuary science. Getting freaky already. It's a little strange. It's a little bit strange. Not not to study mortuary science. I mean, there's a lot of people that go into that field. But well, at to, 17. Well, at 17. But to know what he's about to do, it does make it strange. And the facts that are going to come out. Austin Sig had attended the same elementary school that Jessica went to, Witt Elementary. He had gone to middle school at Wayne Carl Middle School, and he attended high school at Stanley Lake High School. He was also part of the Jeffco Concert Choir during his younger years. And apparently he liked to play video games like most kids. He played World of Warcraft. He played Call of Duty. I mean, pretty standard. Yeah, it's pretty normal. For, for that age group. But Austin Sig left high school in the 11th grade. And instead of graduating, he would go on to get his GED instead. He then enrolled at a school called Warren Tech, where he said he wanted to work in the health or forensic science field. And he even won second place in a competition in the category of crime scene investigation for health occupation students of America. So some type of competition where his entry was focused around CSI. And this is going to be important. You know, as we move through this story, this whole subject of CSI, forensic sciences, uh, mortuary sciences, all of this is going to play a huge factor in the story to come. Here's what we know about Sig's background. He attended Stanley Lake High School. He also took courses at Warren Tech North. It's on the campus of Arvada West. It's a technical school offered through Jeffco. He took courses in forensic sciences. The classes included anatomy, forensic chemistry, and forensic science. He would learn about DNA, crime scene analysis, or CSI, and forensic pathology, the examination of a corpse. And later on... There are going to be a number of people that come forward to talk about Austin Sig. One of these would be his first girlfriend that he dated in middle school through high school. And she said that he was a very sweet boy. Apparently, they had met at some kind of gathering for Christian teens. And she was shocked at the revelations that would come out. Now, she did say that Austin had a collection of swords and knives at his house, but she would say that there is no way that she would have ever thought that Austin Sig could be an evil person. But there were other people from the high school that he attended that shared different types of sentiments. And these were along the lines that they thought Austin Sig was creepy. I mean, that that was the word that other kids used. And then we have to talk about his father, Robert Sig. You know, he had a, a criminal history. You know, he was arrested for things like assault and battery, resisting arrest, domestic violence. 
driving under the influence, and you know a host of other crimes. So his dad had a criminal background. But getting back to that day, Austin Sig is sitting in the Jeep Cherokee. He's watching Jessica Ridgeway walk down the street towards him. He waited until she got to the end of the sidewalk, knowing that she had to cross the street. And just as she walked past his car, he jumped out of the Jeep and grabbed her. And it was said later that Jessica screamed just like she had been taught to do, but there was no one around in the neighborhood to hear her. Austin Sig used zip ties to bind her arms and legs together. And as this is happening, Jessica's screaming, as you can only imagine what this girl's going through, Gibbs. Austin Sig is promising her everything's going to be okay. All she has to do is be quiet. He drives her around for a while, making random turns, not really going anywhere specifically, but eventually he makes it back to his house that he shared with his mother. He drove the Jeep into the garage, closed the door behind him. He cuts off the zip ties and he carries Jessica up to his room. He places Jessica on his bed and he puts a movie on for her, you know, turns on Uh, Netflix and puts on a movie. He next has her change out of her clothing and put on a shirt and shorts that he had laid out for her. And he has her do this inside the bathroom. But after Jessica had changed into the clothes, had come back into the bedroom, Austin Sig tried to strangle her with some zip ties. But as he would later tell police, he couldn't do it. As he was trying to strangle her, the ties they, they dug into his pot. It was hurting him to try to strangle her. We're going to call him a lot of things and we're going to be very angry. I mean, we already are. I yeah. can see it in your face, Gibbs. You're getting pissed. I know how you are. I know how these affect you. And this is a tough one. Oh, yeah. There, there, there's no way around the fact that this is a tough story to tell. Yeah. And I know what's coming, so... But because of this, he ends up strangling Jessica with his bare hands until she was no longer breathing. But that was not enough for Austin Sig because he carried Jessica's body into the bathtub, filled it with water, and placed her face down just to make sure that she was dead. So strangle, drowned. Okay. And it's going to get worse because... Austin Sig would use a saw and razor blades to remove one of her hands and one of her feet. And then he removed her other hand, cut both of the hands into as many small pieces as he could and flushed part the, the parts down the toilet. He would later decapitate Jessica Ridgeway, take off her arms and legs. He put them into plastic trash bags. And then he took her torso, put that into a plastic trash bag as well. And he placed all of these bags in the pool shed in his backyard. The next night, because there were so many police around the city trying to locate Jessica, Austin Sig got freaked out and he decided to drive to a neighborhood in Superior, Colorado, located north of his house taking along with him Jessica's backpack. Inside, he had put her clothes in the backpack, but somewhere along the way, he threw the coat that Jessica had been wearing that day into a random trash can. He also threw away some of the implements that he had used to dismember her as well. And Austin Sig would later tell the police that he put the backpack in an area north of where she went missing so that the police would not search his house and find out what he had done to this little girl. So his thought process was he's leading investigators away from his house. Now, the backpack was found standing upright on the sidewalk like it had just been placed there. And this was on October 7th, just two days after Jessica had gone missing. A man who lived in the neighborhood had actually seen the backpack the night before around midnight, but he didn't make much of it. And he thought, okay, if it's there the next day, I'll check it out. It was still there. The next day he saw it. 
He went over to check it out and he noticed that on the backpack, there was a keychain that read Jessica. But at the time, this man had no idea that it was connected in any way to the disappearance case of Jessica Ridgeway. But what he did was that he actually posted it on a website for the town that they lived in. And this was kind of a, you know, a website where people could post whatever, jobs for hire. He posted it as lost and found. And someone in the neighborhood who saw this, they came to the man and said, hey, you, know, you have something very important. I think you have something related to the case of Jessica Ridgeway. So the man called 911. Now, when you find something on the side of the road, I just can't believe somebody doesn't open it up. If you find a woman's purse, if you find a wallet, if you find a briefcase, backpack, you're not going to open it up. I'm not going to touch it because I don't want my fingerprints on it because <laughs> who knows what it's from. I think majority of people open it up. No, and no, I, I agree with you because really that's the only way to find out who it belongs to. Mm -hmm. And if you're an upstanding citizen, you want to get that back to the person that, that has lost it. Yeah, I don't think it makes you a bad person because you open up somebody's purse that you found or now, a backpack, you know? I mean, how else are you going to figure out where it goes? Right, but the flip side argument to that gives is, so if he had opened it up, what would it have told him? Well, true. Because all that's inside are some little girl's clothes. So when Jessica's mother finds out that the backpack had been found, I think initially she has some hope there because her thought was that the backpack had been left in plain sight and why would someone harm a child in a bad way and then purposefully just leave some evidence out in plain sight? That that was her thought. Right. Again, I, I can't fault her for that. I have to believe in that situation. You're looking for any type of hope and anything that happens, you're trying to see the best in it. And after the backpack is found, now keep in mind, just a couple of days after she'd gone missing, Jessica's father made the trip to Colorado. And as a family, they're waiting for any news about Jessica. But we know, Gibbs, and this is the heartbreaking part of it, she's never coming back. I mean, she's already been murdered by this point. They're still holding out hope for Jessica's return. They're asking the media and the public for any help that they can give to help bring Jessica back. And during this time, Austin Sig is very worried about the police and all of the tactics at their disposal that they were using to try to find Jessica and by extension, try to find the person that had either taken her or possibly harmed her. And Austin Sig should be worried at this point in time. He has done something so horrific. It's hard to even talk about it. It's hard to even put words around it that a 17-year-old kid could do something like this. But because of this worry, because of this concern, Austin Sig said that he knew he had to do something with the rest of Jessica's body. Because remember, he still has some of it. So he brings the torso back into his house from the shed, washes it, puts it in two black trash bags with red handles, and ties the handles together to secure it. But what he would later say is that prior to placing her torso in the trash bags, he had removed all of the organs from her body and flushed them down the toilet. So he gutted her. Let's just call Essentially. It what he did. Yeah. Which is disgusting. The whole thing is disgusting. And then took the time to flush piece by piece down the t toilet because there's no way you could just flush that hole. So he had to sit there and chop and flush and chop and flush. And it, it's wow. But I go back, Gibbs, to the fact that. This kid is learning about mortuary sciences. He's learning about forensics, CSI. 
you know, how much of this, of what he's doing goes back to those things that he's learning about. And maybe we'll talk about it more as we go on into why would he do this in the first place? But I kind of wanted to bring it up now because he would talk about it later that he used gloves. Sure. He was trying to be very careful. He didn't want to leave any fingerprints on her body. This is not normally, I would say, how a 17-year-old's mind works. No, he learned things from this class because he even placed a cross within her vagina area in hopes that when the police find the torso, it throws them off and, again, makes them think that it's some kind of religious wacko or cult. Or maybe cult maybe a cult has done this. Right. Yeah, I, I just go, I go back to the fact that a 17-year-old doesn't normally take these type of precautions. So I think you're right. I think he learned a lot of this in the studies that, that he had been taking. On October 10th, there were some maintenance workers picking up trash in a park. They discover a plastic garbage bag around 2 p.m. And it's sitting out in the open near a drainage ditch on the roadside. They said that the bag was very heavy and they actually flagged down an animal control officer that was driving by. He gets out, looks inside the bag and immediately sees human remains. And this created a media firestorm because you have to think the evening news is talking about Jessica, the whole town, surrounding towns, the whole state is focused on finding this girl. I don't know how far it extended, but pretty far, I would imagine. The police are not giving out exact details at this point, but they have said that they found a set of human remains that were not whole. And these remains, it turns out, were found only nine miles from Jessica's home. And it's two days later that the police make the announcement that DNA testing done confirmed the remains were that of Jessica Ridgway. So unfortunately, at this point, Jessica's family, they know. They they know that she's gone. Mm-hmm. They know she's never coming back. And that's a feeling, Gibbs, that, that I have a really hard time with. Trying to understand or trying to even think about what what did they go through? But police have to switch gears. And they have to go from searching for Jessica to trying to bring her killer to justice. And you think about what the community was dealing with. They've now gone from looking for a little girl and putting their resources towards that to thinking, hey, we've got a murderer in our town and nobody knows who it is. Police increase patrols around the schools, parents They didn't drop their kids off anymore. They were walking them all the way into their classrooms and they were going into the school to pick them up. Yeah. I mean, everybody's on high alert. Yeah, absolutely. And should be. I would be too. You know, this brought about an increase on talking with kids about stranger danger, the awareness of how to deal with with certain situations. Right. Buddy system. Remember the old buddy system? The buddy system. And also how to talk to children about the death of Jessica Ridgway. Because remember, she was loved in this school. So all of her friends are going to find out what happened. And you have a whole set of parents that have to figure out how to tell their kids what happened to their friend. I mean, this, it was, it had to have been tough for Everybody involved. And it was senseless. We're going to talk about that. Now, we have to go back a little bit in time to Memorial Day of that year because police were working a case about a jogger near an area called Kettner Lake. And this was very close to where Jessica had lived. And the case involved an attempted kidnapping of a woman at Kettner Lake on Memorial Day. Police had asked anyone if they had any details. 
Now, I don't think they had any idea at this point whether or not the attempted kidnapping could be related to Jessica's case, but I don't think they were ruling it out. So they're asking people if they had any details about either case. And one thing that the police did, they released pictures of the wooden cross found on Jessica to see if anyone had information about that. Because I think police knew, Gibbs, that this was a clue that could be integral to catching whoever killed Jessica Ridgway. Yeah, so I think at this point they're thinking, you know, this wasn't actually Jessica's cross. So it had to come from the suspect's home or somehow tied to him or her at this point. So I think that's why they wanted to get it out there to see if anybody could recognize it. A friend of Jessica's family created a website where people could remember her and at the same time help her family pay for some of the funeral costs. On the day of Jessica's funeral, and this blows me away, Gibbs, more than 2,000 people showed up to remember Jessica Ridgway. And that's pretty impressive, knowing that 1,000 people went out to look for her. I mean, that just shows you how much people cared. 2,000 people. Yeah, that's a lot. Now, this was a time of grief for the family, no doubt about that. But Jessica's favorite song was Call Me Maybe by Carly Rae Jepsen. And it was played to a montage of photos of Jessica showing her life so that they could celebrate the way Jessica lived her life and her memory. And it was said that a lot of people that showed up to the funeral wore purple to honor Jessica because they knew it was her favorite color. On October 17th, the police are still canvassing and they're starting to get closer to the area where Austin Sig lived. And at this point, a friend of Austin's mother called the FBI saying she was worried about Austin and that he could possibly have been the killer because she recognized the cross that police were showing. And it pays off. So police went to Sig's house to collect a DNA sample and questioned Sig. But Austin said that he had been home sleeping at the time when Jessica was killed. And during the interview, police noticed that he was wearing a cross and police asked him about it. But they would come out and say that he was very calm in answering their questions. So they left. They sent his DNA off with all of the other DNA that they had collected to be tested. But at that point in time, police did not think that Austin Sig was the killer. Five days later, on October 22nd, the media announced that there had been a connection made between the jogger at Kettner Lake, who had almost been kidnapped, and the murder of Jessica Ridgway. It was after this came out that Austin Sig reportedly told fellow classmates that he felt wobbly and very sick. And his mother would later say that he actually slept in her bed that night. So you know, Gibbs, this 17-year-old is feeling the pressure. It's coming down for sure. The, the walls are closing in around him. And at that age, he's not going to be able to handle it. And it's the very next day that Austin Sig would tell his mother, Mindy, that he had something really important to tell her. And for some reason, his mother must have had some kind of intuition about this because she asked him before he even started talking. Does this have something to do with Jessica? It could be her cleaning up the bathroom and maybe he didn't leave it as clean as he thought or. I don't know. I think the the router, the router router people coming out to clean out the drains from everything he flushed down there. Did you say router router? What's it called? Well, rotor router. (laughs) Router router. Router router. Rotor router. Yeah, you don't want your router route it. No, you don't. (laughs) But she did. She had some kind of intuition about this. Yeah. And, you know, they sat down. Moms normally do. They do. Moms yep. have, have an intuition. They know what's going on. They sat down. He basically told her everything. 
and she immediately called 911. Hello? Hi, this is Molly at Westminster Police. Can I help you? Hi, um, I need you to come to my house. Um, my son wants to turn himself in for the R- Jessica Ridgeway murder. And what's going on there? Now, Can you not hear me? He just confessed to killing her. I know. I, w- I want you to tell me what's going on. Can you tell me exactly what he said? That he did it, and he gave me details, and her remains are in my house. Did you see them? No. Is he there with you? Yes. Is he cooperative? Yes. How old is your son? 17. What is your son's name? Austin Tate. So I have to say, this 911 call is 17 minutes long. And I think a lot of it's very important, so I've chunked it up into some smaller bites. But we've talked about, Gibbs, what Jessica's family went through. Imagine what Mindy Sig is going through right then when she makes this call. Yeah, I can't can't imagine that either, you know, um... I mean, clearly she did the right thing, calling right away. And you can, I think you can kind of gauge by her voice that I think she's in, she's in shock. She would have to be. You know, she's in shock for sure. Your child has just come to you and said that they've murdered a 10 year old girl. I I don't even know how you process that. And I don't think she could have Mm -mm. in the time before she made the call. Do you think that Austin would talk to me? Will you talk to her? Yeah, hold on. Okay. Hello. Is this Austin? Yes, it is. Hi, Austin. This is Molly at the Westminster Police Department. Hi. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on right now or how you're feeling or, or how did this come about? Uh, I, I, I don't exactly get why you're asking asking these questions I murdered Jessica Ridgeway okay there is I have proof that I did it I there is no other question you just have to send a squad car something down here and right. I will answer all the questions that you want to ask okay. or anyone wants to ask of me as soon as you just you gotta get down here okay Austin I have a police officer that's gonna come over to your house okay can you tell me what part of the house that her remains are in? Underneath the house and across this. Okay, did you know Jessica before this? No, I did not. Do you have any weapons in your house? I do, but I plan to use absolutely none of them. I will be sitting in my front room when the police officer arrives. Or I'll be right next to my mother. I have knives in my room, um, and we own a few guns, but I'm, okay. I'm giving myself up completely. There will be no resistance whatsoever. Okay. Have you committed any crimes like this before? This before? Um, I mean, are, do you have a criminal history of any sort? The only other thing that I have done that before this was the Kettner Lake incident where the woman got attacked. That was me as well. And other than that, the only criminal history I have is a speeding ticket. So I think the 911 operator is doing a really good job staying positive and not freaking them out on the other, on the other side, you know? Yeah, she, I agree. She's trying really hard. If you listen to the whole thing, that's such a stressful job. It, it, I would never really try to critique a 911 operator, but she does get under their skin a little bit if you listen to the whole thing. I don't know if it's in the parts that I have. You can tell in her voice she's trying to be very soft. But the the more she gets on tape, the better it is for the case, just in case when they get there, they recant, right? I mean, they have a 911 recording it goes. It carries a lot of distance. Yeah, and I, I assume that they have a playbook, right, for for different scenarios. And she's following that playbook because at one point, I think it's Mindy does say, "Can you just stop asking questions? We'll answer all the questions when 
the police get here. But to your point, I think she's doing her job. I think she's trying to get as much information as she can. It's going to be on tape and it's going to be used if needed later on. Is Austin still there with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I won't let him out of my sight. Okay. Where are you guys at in the house? In my room. Okay. Has Austin been diagnosed with any mental health um, mental health issues? Does he see a counselor or take any medication? He saw a counselor um, years ago okay. for um, porn. And we were talking and we think that might have led to it, but I don't know. So if you couldn't hear that, that was porn? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Mindy says that Austin saw a counselor for a porn addiction. And in the talk that they had, they must have had before making the 911 call, there was some back and forth of him saying that maybe that led to what happened. Mindy, take a couple deep breaths for me, okay? Is Austin still there with you? No, I'm hugging him. Okay, you guys are hugging? Okay, you you definitely did the right thing. You tell me when the officers get there. They're coming to your front door. Okay? I don't see them. I don't see them yet. You don't see them? No. And you're at the front door? Yeah. Okay, they're they're on their way. And like I said, they're plainclothes Westminster officers. There's nobody here. Yeah. Okay. They're they're walking up to your house. Okay. They for their for their safety reasons they park down the street and they're walking up. Okay. Okay. And like I said, they're going to be plain clothes. They're not FBI. Okay. They're Westminster police officers and they're coming to help you. We're going to get this all sorted out. Okay. I don't see them. You are. I don't see them. You don't see them yet? No. Do you have a front porch light on or anything that I could make sure that they go to? Yeah. Your front porch yeah. light is on? Uh, what, Austin? What do you say? Okay. Are you still with Austin? Yeah. Okay. What is... I know. I know. <laughs> are you are you with the officers or what just what no they're not here okay is austin still calm is how is his demeanor I right need now to hurry up. i'm trying to get them to hurry okay like i said we we're getting officers there as quickly as we can is Austin okay with you right now? Yeah, he's just getting really anxious and oh. so am I. Okay. Talk me again. Go. Okay, can you hear me? They're here. They're coming up. They're coming up to the door? Yeah. Okay. Do you see it? do you see the plainclothes officers and their badges? Yeah, they're here. Okay, I'll let you go speak with them, okay? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. So like I said, this entire 911 call lasted 17 minutes. We heard just a portion of it. Seems like a, a little bit of time before somebody got there. Seems like a, yeah. Seems like a long time to me, to be honest with you. I mean, if it was a break in, I think somebody would could have got there faster. I'm just surprised. I uh, thought about that too, yeah. Giz, as, as I was researching it. But one of the things I wanted to talk about is, so I broke it down into four clips and we talked about in, in the first clip, it was almost like his mom was in shock. And in the first three, she was holding it all together pretty well, but by that fourth clip, and that's towards the end, that's the last couple minutes of the 17 minute 911 call. You can hear it. She's starting to cry. She's starting to become a little agitated that it's taking so long for officers to respond. And she even says, you know, Austin's getting agitated as well. Right. So that's why I say, I think it was a very long 17 minutes. Yeah. I'm sure it felt like two hours Um, Yeah, or longer, you know? So, and I'm sure at that point she, it's all sinking in and it's 
you can only hold so much in before it really just starts pouring out. So once police got Austin to the station, he confessed for six hours, giving very graphic details, telling everything that he had done in such a way that there was no question that he was the person that killed Jessica Ridgway. Obviously, this is where we got much of the detail that we provided early on. Now, this confession, it was a surprise to police because all along, they thought that the suspect that they were looking for was going to be an adult male. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, most suspects are. You know, you don't have a lot of 17-year-old murderers. Now, one thing that Austin said, and and it kind of goes back to the part of the 911 tape that talks about porn is he said that he was dealing with a very high sexual drive when he kidnapped Jessica. Now, he initially denied sexually assaulting her, but later on, he confessed to doing so. The DNA testing would come back and it would link Austin Sig to the murder of Jessica Ridgeway, as well as to the attack on the woman at Kettner Lake. And Austin Sig would tell police that his plan had been to do to the woman at Kettner Lake the same thing that he had done to Jessica. But the woman managed to escape him. Sig ended up pleading guilty to all of the charges against him right before he was getting ready to go to trial. He pled guilty to first degree murder, sexual assault of a child, and attempted kidnapping. Those first two charges were related to Jessica Ridgeway, and the third was related to the woman in the Kettner Lake attack. But since Austin Sig was 17 at the time of the murder, he would not be eligible for the death penalty. He could only get a life sentence. Testimony and sentencing included graphic descriptions of how Austin Sig killed the 10-year-old. A psychologist says Sig displayed callousness and called him a necrophiliac. He planned it before he kidnapped, uh, before he kidnapped her because when he was asked by police, what were you planning on doing to the jogger? He said the same thing that I did to Jessica. The only time that Austin Sig showed any emotions during his sentencing was when he cried at the point where Jessica's family was giving their impact statements and talking about their memories of the little girl. Prior to this, he had been absolutely stoic, but it was said that he openly wept as the family shared how they were going to remember Jessica. I don't think that the defendant has the right to hear how he affected my, me, my family, or who Jessica was. Once we walk out of this courtroom, we'll not remember his name. She was an amazing little girl. Her life touched so many people. And it was snuffed out before her time. I cannot help but have joy and relief in my heart because my lovely little Jessica is safe in a place where no one can ever hurt her again. So that first person was Jessica's mother, Sarah. And then the second one was a friend. Jessica's grandmother also gave an impact statement saying, quote, I miss her with every breath. And many of the family members talked about the light that Jessica brought to them and how they were learning to deal with her being gone the best they could. Her mother shared photos of Jessica growing up from a baby to a little girl and said that, her baby Jessica would stay 10 forever. Austin Sig was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years on November 19th, 2013. Sig called himself evil in regards to what he did to Jessica. And he was given a very complex sentence. The judge imposed the maximum for several of the 15 counts essentially ensuring that Austin Sig would never be a free man. So although he got first degree murder with a possibility of parole after 40 years because he was only 17, the judge decided to give Austin an additional 86 years after he is eligible for parole. So, I mean, that tells you, Gibbs, how 
heinous, how brutal this crime was. Yeah. The judge was going to make damn sure that this man, boy, he's, at this point, he's, he's 18. A, he's a, yeah, he's a, he's a man now. He's never going to see the light of day. October 5th, 2012 was a tragic, tragic day, but it started the quest for justice, justice for Jessica and justice for the individual that committed one of the most horrific crimes in memory. Today, the legal proceedings have been concluded. Mr. Sig has been held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. The sentence imposed is life plus 86 years. We are confident that this sentence ensures that Austin Sig will never ever leave the Department of Institutions and he will never ever be in a position to prey on members of our community. Got what he deserved. Yeah, and I think that sums it up pretty well. So in 2014, Austin Sig was moved out of state, out of Colorado to another prison. He was moved to an unknown location for the safety and privacy of himself, his family, and the family of Jessica Ridgway. Now, I don't know what that's all about, but somebody felt strongly that he had to be moved. A year after Jessica was killed, the park where she used to play was rededicated in her memory. It was named the Jessica Ridgway Memorial Park. And it wasn't just rededicated, it was remodeled you know, to include slides, swing sets, and they were all done in her favorite color, purple. That's awesome. It is awesome. Now, it gives me the chills a little bit. And on top of that, the sidewalk around the park has knock-knock jokes written on it, the kind that Jessica loved. They also set up a memorial fund for girls to attend cheerleading camp in Jessica's memory. And Jessica is also the inspiration for what is known as the Lassie Project. And this is a system which tracks a child through phone GPS. In 2014, at the park named in her honor, there was an event to honor missing children of Colorado where balloons were released into the air. And Jessica's memory continues to live on with the Jessica Ridgeway Legacy Fund. And this fund helps support animal and youth initiatives in her memory. So I know she's gone, Gibbs. Yeah. And Austin Sig did a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah, can't even describe how bad it was. And I don't know if that's something that he would take back if he could. I don't know anything about his mindset. But it wouldn't matter because he can't. No, what's done is done. I mean, this is one of those things that it it can't be unwound. He changed the future for so many people with that one decision. No, I think you're right. He changed all of Jessica's family, her friends. He changed his own family. Yeah. Forever. Exactly. I mean, it it's hard to imagine how many lives this one action touched. Above and beyond the most precious, which was was Jessica. Right. All right. So that is it. Uh, Another episode of True Crime All the Time. So for Mike. And Gibby. Stay safe and keep your own time ticking.